Hi, this is Justin Chivlo here at the Royal Ontario Museum. Today I will be interviewing two of the members of the Royal Ontario Museum Learning Department. Miss Wendy Ying, the Learning Department staff, and Jeanette Aokweyakshi. Hi. Hi. I'm the Indigenous Outreach and Learning Coordinator in the Learning Department and I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Welcome. Why is um, Indigenous content, content included um, within the Royal Ontario Museum Learning Department? Why is it important? Sorry. Super. I've been at the Royal Ontario Museum as the Indigenous Outreach and Learning Coordinator since 2014 and one of my first tasks was actually to create the Indigenous Advisory Circle where we canvassed a whole lot of different uh, indigenous professionals across sectors that all lead to education because I am in the ROM learning department. So we have about eight IAC members that not only represent educators in the classroom, consultants, youth, elders, but we also have me members of the Ministry of Education on our IAC and members from remote communities on our IAC. And the Indigenous Advisory Circle is really a committed group of indigenous professionals who are helping us go the right way here at the Royal Ontario Museum. In my language, we would say go the right way. So our larger goal is to make sure that we infuse Indigenous content in all of our school visit offerings. And so a big part of my role is working very closely with the Indigenous Advisory Circle and we meet four times a year. Some folks call in and one of our youth cabinet members has actually helped us figure out how to do video conference so that we actually have good looking faces of our members from away and it saves us money on the conference call. The bigger part of that is we get advice from the Indigenous Advisory Circle on exhibits. We have curatorial ROM staff and we, it includes a curatorial as a member of that, of that committee. And what stands out is it's an opportunity to be sure that we're consistent in our offerings to the Indigenous community. We talk about how we talk, use Indigenous language and always giving us feedback on how important it is that Indigenous people are not just entertainment. Indigenous people are skilled in lots of different ways. So we have an event coming up as an example for National Aboriginal Day through the Learning Department and our Indigenous Advisory Circle gave us great feedback and bigger part of that day is they want no song and dance. They don't want people to sit back and be entertained. They want them to engage and have a memorable experience. So our event will be National Aboriginal Day celebration and it'll be themed reconciliation through participation. So people aren't just sitting around letting us do all the work, but they're gonna actually fully engage. We have a powwow boot camp. We have the Métis Nation of Ontario who's gonna teach us some traditional games. We'll have some professional storytellers in the hut and we'll also make some art with Red Purple Spectacle Arts. Good afternoon, Wendy. Thank you for coming. Um, I have a couple of questions that I would like to ask you, if you don't mind. Sure. My first question is, the Kiowa, the Kiowa Wind Memorial uh, Indigenous Memorial Internship was formed, and what is the Royal Ontario Museum's involvement? So, Kiowa Macomb was uh, our inaugural Indigenous youth intern mm -hmm. and so he did a lot of work to um, research and develop and um, help to deliver our uh, ROM youth cabinet program specifically so really um, his role was pivotal in helping us launch this program and so um, we created this internship fund um, in his name so that uh, we can continue to have uh, Indigenous youth interns like yourself mm -hmm. join us um, on a regular basis to continue that work and his legacy. Awesome, great. My second question is, in your, in your words, what, what short-term and long-term outcome would you like to see um, of the Kiowa Wind Memorial Internship? So I think short-term, you know, for us this year is a pilot year. It's mm -hmm. our first year. Um, with uh, developing the youth cabinet and uh, the program and so we in the short term have learned a lot about um, you know everything from recruiting young people um, you know ensuring that the projects that we work on are youth 
by youth for youth so mm -hmm. that they're um, driven by youth and that we as a museum provide them with the agency whether it be equipment supplies relationships connections resources to realize their vision of their project so um, that's the short term you know um, I guess goal is to um, create this program pilot it this year and the long term is really to um, make long-term connections with young people both through the program and then through the projects that the youth cabinet will work on to create a long-term relationship with young people so that they're engaged in, with the ROM not only as young people but as they um, become adults, young adults and then adults etc. Mm -hmm. So for us our work is really about building relationships, long-term relationships with uh, people in the province and that um, we engage them in our research and collections and people who animate them every day on the floor so that they can see the relevance of our work to their everyday lives. As a youth intern, um, what can I, um, how can I advance my professional development within the learning department? Sure. So, um, you know, we, you know, as we did with Kiowa, we had Jeanette and I and Kiowa had conversations with him about his interests and areas that he wanted to learn more about in the museum. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really about connecting you with um, your interests, you know, even if it's, uh, for example, a lot of people when they think about the museum and, and who works in a museum and what work do you do, they often think of curators and educators, but we have people who are in, you know, keep, who keep the building um, up and running. We have, you know, a building that's over a hundred years old and in a crystal and how do you keep it running every day. We have people who are, you know, they come from business and accounting and economics, so they have, they're looking at how do we keep the, not only the building running, but also how do we, um, you know, sustain our work um, through funding and budgets. We have people who are, you know, in the collections, working with the collections every day. We have conservators who conserve the collection. So there's so many functions across the museum. So, you know, it's really having a conversation with you about what your interests are and then um, creating opportunities for you to connect with those different areas so that you can learn more about those areas. Because um, we recognize with the youth internship, the whole, um, one of the main objectives is to um, build your own skills and knowledge. Um, and so we're, that's the point of, you know, this internship is that we can support that um, with, with you. Yeah. Nice. Thank you so much, Wendy. This is Justin Chiblo uh, at, at the Royal Ontario Museum. Thank you so much. Chimigwech. I'd like to thank you for coming and doing this interview. Until then, Leslie. Anin, hello everybody, welcome back. We're here today with Ken Lister, the Assistant Curator of Anthropology, and we're here in the First People's Gallery at the Royal Ontario Museum. Hi, Ken. Hello. Can, thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about where we are today and what we're standing in front of? Well, this is the, it's the Daphne Cockwell Gallery of Canada, First Peoples. It's a space that's devoted specifically to the First Peoples collections that we have here at the Royal Ontario Museum. It's a gallery that opened in 2006, so it's 10 years old now. Okay. But the gallery was um, designed never to be finished, so we're always rotating exhibits through the gallery. Again, it's devoted to the First Peoples mm -hmm. of Canada. And behind us, um, as we work with the, develop the collection, we work with Indigenous advisors. So right. the gentleman that you see here right behind us is Louis Bird, mm -hmm. an elder from Piawonic in Northern Ontario, and he worked with us uh, when we were looking at the collections from Northern Ontario and Quebec. But we also had a Northwest Coast advisor, and she, Allison Nice, she advised with respect to the Northwest Coast, and the same with the, the Plains, the Great Lakes, and, uh, and the Inuit as well. So, and that was a, a relationship that we had right from the very beginning right. of when we were starting to think, what is it we would like to do? What's the philosophy of the gallery? Right. What collections would we have? And then finally, writing the labels and installation. Okay. So do the advisors change or is it the same advisors that um, help with the gallery at all times? No, nope, the advisors will change. So oh, okay. if we're putting in a new collection from a different area, we would have an advisor from that area. And then say for instance, I'm doing another exhibit on the, uh, say, the, uh, in, the Indigenous Peoples in the Yukon. Right. I'd work with an advisor from the Yukon, and okay. in that case, Louis would uh, 
you know, his time would have been up essentially, right. and so we would put the uh, the new advisor in. And what we did here is they were working with us. We asked them to choose an object that was compelling to them, right. and then we would put that object in with their label. And the idea here is to keep the curatorial voice out of the introduction of the gallery. Okay, that's great that you keep such a strong connection with the Indigenous peoples, uh, so that they can decide really what happens here in the First Peoples Gallery. Well, they certainly help us with uh, with the decisions because they're the experts, really. We, uh, you know, we curate, you know, part of our job is to curate the collections, but the other important part of a, of a museum is to provide historical context, cultural context, and that's where we depend upon Native advisors to help us out with determining what the object is, right. what it was used for, what it dates to, what the materials are in some cases. So it's very important that museums um, keep a relationship with Indigenous peoples. Great. So in respect to this uh, case here, I know that you had some participation in this. Did you take these photos? Or? I did, yes. Yeah, this was a situation where I was doing research actually on snowshoes. Okay. One of the uh, objects that I particularly like because I yeah, are snowshoes because you cannot live formally anyways in the north right. without snowshoes. So it's one That's of those true wonderful artifacts that were invented by um, indigenous peoples and I think along with the birch bark canoe and the Inuit kayak snowshoes is a high point in human technological achievement it seems to me. So this is a, um, a project that I was working with again with Louis Bird this goes way back to the 1980s and he and Jean-Michel Hunter were making a pair of snowshoes as you'll see in the images here so I was particularly interested in in snowshoe construction, uh, the kinds of wood that were used, how the wood was bent. And uh, for instance, on this particular piece here, once the wood is bent, how is it kept bent? And there you can see there's a form that keeps it bent until mm -hmm. the wood is dry. So, and also I'm particularly interested in the philosophical and the metaphysical aspects of snowshoes in which there's um, um, important um, attributes, especially with respect to netting. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so again, getting back to him, really interested in the whole historical and cultural context around the phenomenon of snowshoes. And Louis Bird, who was our advisor, he was a hunter and gatherer and a storyteller. So it's axiomatic that he would choose a pair of a pair of snowshoes to represent himself, his community, and his culture. Right. Well, thank you for that, Ken. Do we want to see another part of the gallery? Let's do it. Okay, let's go. So you mentioned a little bit about um, how the gallery was meant to be continually evolving and how it was never meant to be finished. So what's happening over here? Well, this is exactly that. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's evolving. So this is a section in the First Peoples Gallery that's devoted to the art of Paul Kane, Okay. Canadian artist. Uh, when you're dealing with art such as this, specifically watercolors and pencil on drawings, the rule of thumb is six uh, six months on display and five years off display. Right. Wow. So this section is constantly oh. rotating. Okay. So this is an exhibit that we're, uh, we're, we're putting in now. It should be open by the end of next week. Okay. Just on this wall primarily. And it's going to consist again of Inuit, uh, sorry, of Paul Kane's paintings mm. along with drawings and in this case some artifacts that he collected. Okay. So this is an example of where the gallery is always in a state of being refreshed. Part of that is because we want to bring the collections out from the storage room so people have you know, a continuing idea of what the wrong collections are, right. but also it's fundamental for the, uh, for the maintenance and the conservation of the artifacts themselves. Okay, so you talk about um, the collections being off for a five-year period. Um, in that five-year period, how do you ensure that the sacred items are taken care of in a traditional sense? In a traditional sense, well, um, we, in the collection room, as you have seen, mm -hmm. we have a cabinet that's devoted specifically to sacred objects. So those objects that we know are sacred, and by that I mean objects that the communities would prefer us not to um, have available for right. research, uh, in some cases exhibition, 
Um, so we keep those in, in a separate cabinet. But nevertheless, we also, every object is looked after in the same way, right. regardless of whether it's sacred or it's not. Kept in climate control, temperature control, <clears throat> excuse me, behind in the in cabinet so light can't get into it. Right. And that's the problem with galleries such as this, is you always have light. And light is always damaging objects. So when they go into our collection room, it goes into darkness. Unless, of course, we're working in the room, but generally speaking, the lights are off. And so this is to keep the collections as pristine as we possibly can, uh, hopefully forever. Mm -hmm. um, so I started the Indigenous Advisory Circle about three years ago, and something that I didn't know prior to joining the ROM is that um, items get smudged. Uh, elders come and visit some of the items, and um, bundles go in with the, with the items. Can you talk a little bit about some of those items? Yep, that's absolutely true. The, um, we actually invite, when we're asked, uh, for an Indigenous peoples to, to, as you mentioned, smudge, mm -hmm. burn tobacco, burn sweet grass. And in case in point, just yesterday, we had um, a group from Minnesota oh, wow. who put in bundles of cedar in with our uh, birch bark scrolls. Oh, great. So this is, and this gallery has also been, has been smudged as well. In fact, before we opened the gallery in 2006, when it was completely empty, it was just a single room, there was a smudging ceremony we, we had to smudge the whole room. And this is uh, a request that comes to us from a variety of Indigenous peoples mm -hmm. and being uh, particularly interested in the welfare of Indigenous collections then this is something that we actually that we welcome. Right. We also have um, up in our storage area a sac what we call a sacred room mm -hmm. which is a room that has its own dedicated vent. Okay. So if people or Indigenous advisors or groups would like to come in and to study or to have ceremonies around a particular object, mm -hmm. we can take the object in there mm -hmm. and they can burn tobacco or, or um, any, of the sweet grit, any of the medicines yeah. because it has its own vent, which right. mean, it simply means we don't have to inform the fire department and yeah. security and so on. We can just go ahead and do it. So it can be off the cuff. It doesn't necessarily have to be previously arranged right. in that sense if somebody just feels as because they're working on the collection and it's something they would like to do, then we can do that. Wow. So this is really the ROM's attempt to uh, try to make a big institution like this uh, welcoming to Indigenous peoples from around the world. I think it's so important to keep that relationship and, and to see some of the items and how you've maintained relationships with the advisors, I think it's really important. It is important, yeah. yeah. Awesome. yeah that's, it's, you, when you think of it, the collections are theirs. Yeah. I mean, they belong to the ROM, yes, but the ROM is really just keeping mm -hmm. the collections for all the people of Ontario and Canada. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing more and more of Indigenous people, especially from the Arctic and the subarctic, that are being able to come down. Right. And that's another reason why we like to have the galleries rotate, because in some cases it'll be collections from their particular communities, which is important for us to represent. And of course, they want to be represented in a museum such as this. Right. Well, thank you so much, Ken, and for um, keeping such a strong connection with Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, and for taking care of the gallery. Miigwech. Miigwech. Thank Miigwech. you very thank much. You. Pleasure.